Now, you've been in existence how many years has it been? The, well, CARE the came into CARE? existence in January of 2002, so we're looking at, you know, 15 years since we've been around, close to it. Very interesting. What percentage of carpet collected, post-consumer carpet collected, is polyester? Today, <clears throat> the question requires a little nuance to answer. If you look at the amount of polyester that we think is in the flow out there, somewhere on the order of 30 to 40 percent. But if you go talk to individual recyclers, some of them will tell you it's not uncommon to get a truck in that's 70, 80 percent polyester because a lot of it's being ripped out and replaced with new material. So uh, it depends on who you talk to. But on average across the U.S., I'd say 40, 45 percent is probably a realistic number. How did that <clears throat> reach as, as high a percentage in such a short time? Well, I think there's a couple factors. Number one is um, consumers were looking for new styling options, looking for more economical products. Polyester is a relatively inexpensive fiber compared to nylon. There's tremendous capacity for polyester on the planet. In fact, the demand, uh, the, the supply of polyester grossly outstrips the demand, which is why the economics for polyester are as low as they are. You put those factors together and some new technology that the mills developed for, you know, better twists, better construction, better performance on the floor, and you've seen an explosion in polyester products out there in the marketplace. You look at Main Street, all the condos and apartments that are being built. You know, the builders are looking for inexpensive floor coverings to put down. You've got turnover every two, three, four years. It's pretty easy to put down a new carpet if you have a low-cost alternative, yeah. and polyester meets that bill very nicely. So that turnover is a real reason why polyester has reached such a high percentage a in such driver. a short time. Sure. Now, um, what's your guess as to, how, as to how high that polyester percentage will be in years to come? Well, I've heard speculation. I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I've heard a, a speculation it'll be 50 plus percent in the next year or two. Um, of course, we've got a bit of a wild card going on in the Middle East right now. Uh, we've got a wild card going on with the Chinese economy and the meltdown we heard about this morning in their, in their markets and ours being reflected. So I'm really not sure what's going to happen with our economy over the next you know, 12 to 24 months. But it will increase, and just how high is the question at this point in time? That's probably a fair statement. Now, finding, finding end uses for polyester, that's been the big bugaboo in this yes. whole care organization. How's, how's that? How's that uh, um, being solved? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you that, you know, a year ago, everybody would have said, you know, we've got good markets for nylon. We expect that continue. We're struggling to find markets for PET. Today, with the collapse of price of oil, we're struggling to find outlets for nylon. At the same time, we're seeing outlets for PET grow. And we're seeing them grow primarily because there's a big subsidy on, quote, non-nylon PET polypropylene coming out of California. Uh, polypropylene is going into carpet, I'm sorry, polyester is going into carpet cushion. Um, we see a uh, more competitive marketplace for that. It's going into insulation, uh, wall in type insulation, and it's going into sound barriers under hard surfaces. And I expect those markets will continue to slowly expand. Are there incentives, government incentives or other, to recycle product even in the face of crude being as inexpensive as it is? Other than the fact that California has a, uh, an extended producer responsibility law in the books where they expect care to facilitate that process to take place, there's no subsidies that I'm aware of that's coming from any other source, other than the industry itself supporting that voluntary product stewardship program. I've got gotcha. Update us on that California carpet stewardship uh, program. We were all aware of some of the <coughs> changes that took place, I guess, last the beginning of last year, was it? Yeah. Update us on that. Well, the beginning of last year, we increased the assessment from a nickel a square yard to a dime a square yard. We did that to, to facilitate the higher subsidies that we put in place. We watched the marketplace respond or not respond to those increased subsidies at the same time watching oil come down. We got a pretty strong message from Cal Recycle in September of this year when we submitted our 2014 results that says not good enough. 
you're out of compliance with the statute in these areas. We need to see more. We expect you to submit a new addendum to the plan to tell us how you're going to do more and how you're going to fund it. So um, we immediately increased subsidies across the board and added some new ones, uh, effective the third quarter of this year. Of course, increased subsidies meant we needed more money to pay those subsidies, so we submitted a request to Cal Recycle on November 30th to increase the subsidy from 10 to 20 cents a square yard. On January 26th of this year, they'll have a public hearing, and I fully expect they will approve that increase in subsidy funding. If they don't, it means the increased subsidies that we put in place will immediately have to be rolled back because there, is, there will not be funds available to pay those subsidies. In addition, we're hiring additional resources in California. Uh, we have implemented a grant program in California, grants to provide funding up to $500,000 for new or expansion of existing capacity to produce material. California wants it to be processed in the state, create jobs in the state. And we've also implemented a grant program to facilitate both product development and testing of these products to try to get them qualified to move into certain market applications. So a lot of changes were implemented and, and expect to be implemented as we go forward. The percentage of carpet that's processed in the state of California, is that increasing? Well, in all honesty, Dave, I have to tell your listeners that uh, the third quarter report for California saw a 40% drop in recycled output. So a lot less material is being processed in the third quarter than was processed in the previous quarters. So that, that was not good news. I, I'm not in a position to say what fourth quarter is going to look like yet. I'm hoping that we see a little bit of rebound because 40% is a pretty big drop. But of the processing that takes place, I would tell you that more than 50% currently is being processed in the state of California. And with the shutdown of Evergreen Augusta, that percentage will by default go up. Just because a lot of that obviously was going. Well, correct. I, I see. Correct. Um, <clears throat> the number of processors in the state of California, has that diminished? Yes, we've lost a couple processors over the last couple years. We're down to two major processors in the state right now, but we do have, uh, well I should say, we just had a third one come online uh, in the last month or two, and we have a proposal for another one possibly two to start up in probably the latter half of 2016. What are your, and I know there's a lot of moving parts here, so it's a difficult question to answer, but that's really never stopped me, I guess, before. <laughs> what are your thoughts as to how this is going to play out this year, next year, and on down the road in California? Well, I wish you asked me that question after January 26th because we'll have the ruling on the assessment from California, but also on January 26th we have a board meeting for CARE and we've restructured that board meeting to spend a whole lot more time talking explicitly on these challenges. You know, two key questions that I, that I want to lay out there for us to think about is, you know, um, with the oil price the way it is, um, when will that price return to a level which supports truly supports market-based solutions for these products and outlets in the marketplace. And the question that underpins that one is, and what do we do in the meantime until those oil prices recover? That's the big challenge that we're facing today. So what I would tell you our, our mission is going forward is to figure out, you know, how do we deal with this economic problem? That's not a, not a simple answer and not one that I'm sure we're going to be able to figure out in the short term. Number two, how can we find and develop new additional products into which to put post-consumer carpet. Number three, how can we find outlets for some of the additional materials, in particular the calcium carbonate that comes out of the backing of the carpet. And number four is really how do we stimulate demand in the marketplace? How can we take advantage of the procurement process, maybe in particular the public pr procurement process, to create demand? And I'll wrap that up by saying that California has a law in the books called SABRAC, State Agencies Buy Recycle Content. It was designed specifically for the purpose of using public money to drive the procurement of products that contain these materials. Great idea. The state issued a report in, as a result of 2013 that said the state spent $12 billion on goods and services. Of the $12 billion, $2 billion were spent on buying stuff in the state with public fund money. But when they asked how much of that was SABRAC based, it was only $100 million. 
So the report kind of indicates that the, the agencies of the state have not lived up to the statutes requiring them to purchase under the SABRAC. So, you know, we get hit pretty hard for not meeting the statutory requirements for recycling carpet. State agencies are not hitting yeah. the statute requirements to procure that helps create the demand in the marketplace. So we're talking how do we, how do we jumpstart this? How do we get it going? Is that just bureaucracy? Is that the main uh, hurdle here? Well, I think it's a bit of bureaucracy. I think there's a lot of, we've heard the term silos. I think there's big silos in state agencies. I'm talking to the recycling people over here, and I say, let's sit down with the procurement people over here. Well, that's a different agency. We don't talk to them. Well, let's get up and walk over to their cubicle and have a conversation of possibilities, because if we don't do that, we're not going to solve this problem. Well, it would seem interesting having that happen in a state like California, where they've been ringing the bell for this thing for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's, it's it, you know, California may have the law in the books, but there's other states we're having this conversation. We've got a very healthy conversation going on with the state of Illinois right now, Massachusetts, um, Minnesota continues to be part of the dialogue. South Carolina has a wonderful program going on using market-based solutions. Fortunately, that state is is lucky to have a lot of companies there that do a lot of recycling, so they have opportunities to place some of these materials. You don't have that infrastructure in place in many of the other yeah. states. Now the states that you talked about, are they entertaining a carpet stewardship program or have they taken another tack? Well some of those states have tried to put EPR legislation on the books. They've not been successful doing that. Of course, we go in there, both the care and the carpet industry through CRI go in there and try to explain that we really are based on market-based solutions. That's the way to solve these problems. And oh, by the way, we do have some examples of success. Is, the way we, is there a way we can replicate those successes in some of these other states? But it requires a partnership. And uh, what are your expectations there? Do you expect to see these things flourishing in years to come? I think it's going to be a slow, uh, steady progress that we're going to make as long as we keep the dialogue going and both partners commit to actions that support the efforts going forward with the one caveat here that, you know, if the economy falls off the edge here with what's going on in China today and the stock market and the price of oil, it's going to make it that much more difficult to tackle these challenges in the short term. And when I say the short term, I'm talking about the next two, three, four years. Well, you mentioned earlier hit, what, $60 by 2020? Yeah. If we're lucky? If we're lucky. And so that's going to put, if we're talking on down the road, if we're talking in three or four years, uh, it's going to be tough sledding. Well, you know, Dave, you probably refer back to some of our earliest interviews, and I said to you one of my, my favorite expressions is success is perseverance for one more minute. We've been persevering for a long time, and I think it's going to take another dose of perseverance to get through this cycle that, that we're in right now. But like I said, it's not like we have a blank sheet of paper. We have a lot of good ideas. What's really hurting us are the economics. So we're, we're actually going through the development of an economic model right now that, that looks at here are all the different mechanisms by which you can recycle carbon. They all have different costs associated with them. What is the price sensitivity versus the price of oil? Where does oil have to get to before these various yeah. technology platforms become competitive again in the marketplace? Well, it was, it was interesting when oil was as high as it was. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't all that easy, it seems to me, from talking to you over the years. Right. So I can't imagine, you know, uh, calling people on the phone or knocking on their door that they're all that anxious to talk about this topic. Yeah, it's not easy.